And so I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight you know, to fully get yourself in the room. To fully join me right here in this moment. And so I invite you to relax, to smile, to let go of the day. Let go of anywhere you think you must be. And can you just take some deep, full breaths? Deep, full breaths, just breathing, feeling, experiencing. And just fully be here. Fully be here. And so, yes, I'm getting a little bit of feedback that the, the volume is low. So how about now? Is that, is that any better? Yes. Okay, much better. Beautiful, beautiful. So that was an easy fix. And so we're just relaxing and giving ourselves permission to be here, right here, right now. And so let us breathe together by taking deep, full belly breaths. And I want you to imagine breathing all the way down, all the way down to the soles of your feet, helping the whole body, the whole body to wake up. And so you're saying hello to yourself fully. You're inhabiting yourself. You're feeling your feet here on the floor, here on the ground. You're feeling your, your bottom on the cushion or in the chair. You're inviting the seven chakra centers to awaken. And so you're taking deep, full breaths all the way down. all the way down to the soles of the feet. Feeling the legs waking up, you're feeling the pelvic bowl waking up. Deep, full breaths and saying yes to this moment. Yes, I am here. Yes, I am alive. Deep, full breaths. And so you're breathing into your lower belly, the Hara Chakra. Breathing in and breathing out, saying, I am here. In this moment, I'm awake, I'm alive. I feel the fullness of my being. And so you're breathing into the solar plexus. And again, relaxing the solar plexus, relaxing the hara, relaxing the pelvic floor, the arms, the legs, the hands, the feet. And just getting yourself fully here. You may even feel this sense of aliveness coming forward, you know, as your body wakes up. And so, of course, we're including the heart chakra. We're saying yes. Yes to opening the heart and giving yourself full permission to feel everything within you. Everything. In the depth of your, your being, you are light, you are love, you are bliss. But sometimes when we have a body, when we have human relationships in the world, sometimes we experience sadness or anger or heartache. And so it's okay, let me be the first to say right now, it's okay to feel. It's okay to admit what's here. And so if there's sadness here, we welcome it forward. With a Christ-like acceptance, we welcome it forward. If there's heartache, we welcome it forward. If there's bliss and beauty and wonder, we welcome it forward. Whatever's here, all of it is arising 
within this space of freedom, within this space of love, within this space of awakened awareness. And so as our heart comes online, you begin to feel the whole body, the whole body lighting up, the whole body feeling alive. And we're saying yes, yes to this moment. Yes, whether you're feeling tremendous grief or tremendous bliss, or whether there's dogs barking in your yard, or you're sitting here in absolute silence, we are saying yes to life, yes to love. Yes to this moment. So we're breathing fully and saying yes, yes. And so as you allow everything to come forward, as you give yourself full permission to feel, full permission to experience, as your heart begins to wake up and you feel the aliveness and the beauty of your heart, and yes, the tenderness of your humanity, we are saying yes. We are meeting it all from this place of absolute mindfulness, a mindfulness of the heart. And within this space of mindfulness, we notice spaciousness, freedom, peace, love and compassion. All of this is our nature. And yet in our human nature, we may notice fear, anxiety, hurt, rage, whatever it is, we're saying yes to both. Yes to our absolute divinity. And we are saying yes to the hugeness of what we are. We are saying yes. Yes to this moment. And so I invite you to relax the throat chakra. And if there's feelings within you, I invite you to allow them to flow, to flow up and out of you. Oftentimes there's this great dividing line between who we are in our absolute divinity and the experience that we have as being human. And for many of us, that dividing line is in the throat chakra. We clench the throat chakra, we squeeze it, and we repress the pain deep within us. And so we're giving ourselves full permission to open, to let go, and to say, yes, I'm willing to feel what's here. I'm willing to experience what's here. I'm willing to honor what's here. And I'm admitting all of this is here. My absolute beauty and my heartache or sadness or fear. We welcome it all forward. And so as we again begin to open, open more fully, more inclusively, we open the third eye chakra center and we say yes. We feel the spacious presence of our being. We notice the space out of which thought arises. We notice the space out of which the sound of my voice arises. We notice that there is space here. There's a vastness here. There's a silence here. And so we're saying yes, yes to all of it. And then finally, of course, we're gonna open the crown chakra and just invite Invite there to be this open-hearted receptivity between us and life, between us and God, between us and that which is holy. And so we're giving ourselves full permission simply to open, to receive, to be here now, fully and open-heartedly, we are saying yes. Yes to this moment. To be awake is to say yes to life. It's a willingness to admit there's a humanity here. 
which sometimes cries, sometimes hurts. And there's a divinity here, which is absolutely perfect, absolutely brilliant. There's an innocence here, which has never been harmed. Despite all the pain you've experienced, despite facing death, despite being abused, despite facing illness, that there's something here, something innocent, something quite profound. which is silent, gentle, open-hearted, and yet indestructible. And so we say yes to both. This is what it means to be fully human and fully divine. So we say yes to both. And so I'm going to tell a, uh, a funny story. Uh, maybe it's not so funny, but... Uh, so I invite you, as you listen, you can continue to listen from your heart, not with your minds, you know, just because the, you know, we're stepping out of the meditation, the formal part of the practice. I invite you not to step out, of, not to step out of your heart. And so last, last night at this time, well, I'll say that, uh, you know, back up a little bit. So, so, so June, the month of June is fire season in the Southwest. You know, anything can light a fire here in the Southwest in the month of June. And we've had a very dry, very dry winter this year. Normally we get lots of snow and that provides all this moisture in the mountains. And so, you know, this year in the state of Colorado, we've had a, a number of uh, large forest fires. And so, you know, the community tends to be a little bit on edge when you see, you see the news or you, you know, notice the smoke in the air. And so last night, right about this time, I was walking around my home and, uh, you know, I noticed, I noticed this, this smoke, the smell of smoke. And so I said, what is this? What's going on here? And so I became quite nervous, quite nervous. I said, oh, is there, is there, a, is there a, a, a fire somewhere? Is there a fire? And there absolutely was. You know, I walked around the house and I smelled it. And I asked my wife, I said, I said, do you see, do you see a fire anywhere? Do you see? Do you see a fire? And she said, no. And so I started running down the street. I started running down the street and I began to see that one of my neighbor's homes was on fire. It's just two houses from mine. And so pretty, pretty soon, you know, I found myself yelling and hollering to the neighbors. Someone come. And so I was hollering. I said, call 911. Call 911 and a bunch of neighbors came out and they started, you know, they started just, you know, talking and walking in circles. I said, get us some hoses. Get some hoses now. You know, and there was a couple people standing around. They weren't fully embodied. They didn't know how to respond. They didn't know what to do. And so I was hollering at them, you know, again and again, saying, hey, come on, let's get some hoses here. And so pretty soon, you know, we had, uh, we had some hoses and a ladder and someone was climbing up the roof and there was this just smoke just billowing, billowing out of the, the top of the house. And so there was a fellow on top 
you know, spraying down, you know, the into the attic. You know, and I was knocking on the doors and the windows, and pretty soon I was having to bust the windows open and getting crowbars and knocking down the doors. And, and began, there was a lot of people just walking around in circles. I said, look, let's get these propane tanks out of here. Let's get the, this lawnmower out of here because we didn't want there to be, you know, I didn't want there to be an explosion. I guess there's a lot of folks who just didn't even know, you know, how to think. How to think. They didn't know how to be awake. They weren't fully present. You know, they were just lost in a, a fight or flight response or a sense of confusion. You know, but pretty soon, you know, I was kind of barking orders to everyone. And, you know, we got the door, the back door open and some windows broken. And then, you know, I was telling neighbors, bring more hoses. And we we're having all the neighbors hook up hoses to their house and spray the house down. And, you know, we were you know, looking inside and seeing, is there one, is there anyone inside? Is there anyone struggling? you know, struggling for their life. You know, fortunately, <laughs> we didn't find anyone, you know, but, you know, they said, you know, people were saying, oh, there's animals in there, and so we were, you know, really, you know, really knocking, you know, knocking around and looking around. There's so much smoke in the air. And I said, what can I do? You know, so I went in the house and you know, was turning off the gas, you know, to the, the uh, the hot water heater and to the to the furnace. But just so much smoke was there. You know, it's getting you know, we were all getting quite sick. You know, someone said, Oh, they spoke with the uh, they spoke with the fire department. They said, Don't go in the house but we thought, Well, <laughs> If there's someone in there dying, we're, we're going to go in and we're going to see. And that's probably, of course, <laughs> not good advice. But we couldn't let someone, you know, someone die right there on the other side of the walls. And so, and so we went in, you know, despite, <laughs> despite better judgment, <laughs> we went in. We went in. And so it was quite a chaotic moment. Quite an intense moment. You know, quite a, a brutal moment. Yeah, but we did the best we could. And then by the time the fire department got there and they were they were actually took them a <laughs> took them a long time you know, to, to arrive, you know, we had much of the fire, you know, I don't want to say out, but we had it, uh, you know, it had great, greatly, uh, greatly dissipated. But when I was, was reflecting on it, you know, after I <laughs> had to lay down in the grass and, you know, almost vomit because of, you know, all the smoke I had inhaled and, I, you know, I had blood on my on my arms from uh, from the windows. You know that I'd broken. But when I began to reflect, I saw that there were so many, so many people who just weren't embodied. They weren't ready. They weren't fully. They weren't fully connected to themselves. And because of that, you know, because of that, they weren't able to, to properly respond to the situation. And so it's so important, so important here on the spiritual path that we are embodied, that we don't just have our head in the clouds. It's so important. One of the great things that my teacher did for me was that he forced me to be embodied. He forced me to have my consciousness down in my feet, deep in my belly, awake and alive in the world. And I wasn't here just to 
float around in some heaven world. This was not why I was here. No, I was here to work, <laughs> to work for God. And it's a funny thing, uh, you know, without my glasses, I'm, pre I'm pretty blind. But I have a nose that's like a, uh, like a crime dog, you know, or a drug dog. You know, I can smell, <laughs> I can smell marijuana from like a mile away. You know, it's a little bit of a joke that I have with my friends and when I used to be a high school teacher. You know, they'd be they'd be blocks and blocks away, you know, like a couple football fields away down by the river smoking pot and I could smell it. But as I was walking, you know, as I was walking around my house, I knew that that smell of smoke. It wasn't a forest fire. I knew it was a home fire. And because of the conditions, you know, in this moment, you know, here in southwest Colorado, you know, we could have lost the whole neighborhood, you know, that evening. And so God needs people to respond in this world. God needs people to say, yes, I'm awake. Yes, I'm alive. Yes, I am here. I am here on planet Earth. I'm awake, I'm alive, and I'm willing to be of service. And so in order to fully be of service, you can't have your head in the clouds. You have to have your feet on the ground. You have to be present and awake and aware. You have to be connected with your heart and your belly, not just vast spacious awareness. Vast spacious awareness is a wonderful thing, but it's, an, it's, not, a, it's not a fully helpful thing. If your neighbor's, you know, house is on fire and you're just spacing out, we want to have vast spacious awareness and be rooted in our belly, rooted in our truth. We want to have our feet on the ground and be awake and aware in this world. And so after, you know, we, we knocked down the doors, you know, the house and, you know, broke windows and was you know, tearing things apart, getting junk out of the way so that when the firemen came, they could easily access the house. And like I said, we had to, you know, I went in, turned the gas off. So I wanted it so when the firemen go in there, there wouldn't be an explosion. So that when my neighbors were in there, there would not be an explosion. So it wouldn't just, you know, burn up my whole neighborhood, the whole neighborhood. And so it's this willingness to be awake, to be alive, to be fully present. Despite fear. Despite our fears. And so when I saw my, you know, my hands bleeding from, you know, the glass that I had broken and there's no blood on my, <laughs> blood on my shirt. And, you know, I didn't go home and cry. Take the hose, wash out the cut, and keep spraying the house down and screaming inside. Is anyone there? Is anyone inside? Are you there? And I'm hollering at the other folks. Call 911 again. Where are the firemen? We need some support here. We need more hoses. And so when you're awake, you know what to do. You can listen fully to your gut you can see clearly you can see clearly what needs to happen and so afterwards you know afterwards I, you know i spent you know the rest of the evening being you know quite sick from breathing in way too much smoke you know just laying in the yard and just getting regrounded you know as the the adrenaline was just raging through my body for the next, you know, three or three, three or more hours. It took me a long time of deep, full breathing to get the belly to fully relax. To get the belly to fully relax. And so anyway, so we have, I have a lot of questions tonight. And so, you know, I'll get to those questions and I see that, um, and I have a friend here who wants to ask a question. So I'll get to your, uh, your question in a moment, uh, Vishal. But um, there's a couple that I missed from last week. And so uh, let's see if I can uh, 
answer, you know, work with these real quick. Uh, this is from uh, uh, Felix in Australia. Craig, I'm hoping you might be able to talk a little bit about physical illness and the impact on the body that the awakening process has. Since the kundalini energy started flowing in me a year or so, I started experiencing all kinds of weird, bizarre mystery illnesses. Uh, it's been very puzzling. I've been to the doctor uh, and they couldn't find anything. Do you think that, that uh, our illness is something that you often see in people who are experiencing kundalini energy? Absolutely. And it's just not just Kundalini, you know, any of us who are on the path of spiritual awakening, you may notice different, different uh, illnesses coming forward. You may notice your body doing strange thing, strange things. You may notice neurological, uh, you know, movements happening in your body, your head nodding, you know, there, for about a period of a, a year and a half. I couldn't keep my head on straight when I meditated. My neck would go back, you know, my hands would go up in the air. I'd make these these funny mudras, you know, I'd spontaneously go into asanas. And so, yeah, the body can do and will do all kinds of strange things, not with everyone, but with, with some of us. And, you know, he goes on to ask, do you think that illness can be a clearing out of karma? Yes, absolutely or a side effect of the kundalini rewiring process? Yes, absolutely. And so these are good questions and you know, I'll give short answers because yes, my friend. Now, when you go to the doctor, you know, and if you choose to go to the doctor, which of course may be appropriate. You know, like I had a period where I was having all kinds of seizures. I couldn't hold things. You know, I got all my words mixed up. I lost my memory, all these <laughs> silly things. So of course, you know, my friends and family dragged me to the neurologist a bunch of times and said, there's something really wrong with this guy. But I had faith and trust that, no, it wasn't that. It was, you know, that this was the kundalini energy. Now, it's wise to go see the doctor and rule out anything serious. So, yes, that's wise. But the more, <clears throat> the more you walk forward on the path, the more you'll begin to subtly determine it you know what what's happening within me is this illness is it energetic or does it have to do with you know everyone around town has the flu and so if you feel sick after everyone around town has the flu well you probably got the flu if you're having flu-like symptoms yes it's probably the flu but with me you know there was you know i i had strange mono-like symptoms you know where i was like a little bit sick or i'd have chronic fatigue chronic fatigue would come forward and it would overwhelm me or depression would come forward and oftentimes it would come forward and I could look at it just as a physical thing and try to treat it with medicine which you know I'm not a medicine guy so I almost never did that but when I looked at it from an energetic perspective I realized that these were new worlds coming into me and so oftentimes I'd get really depressed but when I open to the depression, I realize there's a new world here. And at first it just seemed like dry and dull and mundane, it came with heaviness, but I chose to open to it. And then it became a world of spaciousness, a world of freedom, a different kind of freedom than I had known before. And so I encourage you to open to everything that comes to you and see for yourself, see what these things are. But sometimes, yes, you know, we have to wait it out. Sometimes we get very sick. I have worked with some individuals who've been in bed for one or two years because such chronic fatigue has come forward, you know, due to the extent of the uh, difficulty that their body has had with the awakening process. Or perhaps it had to do with some old karma that was being burnt off. And so absolutely, absolutely. But, you know, it's always wise to go to the doctor you know, and just see, is there something going on with your body that's treatable with medication? Then take it. Take good care of your body. You know, sometimes these symptoms can come forward if we're overworking. And so I noticed that I used to get that, that mystery illness when I was overworking. And so the kundalini demanded 
the spiritual awakening process demanded that I take it very slow, very slowly, very peacefully. And anytime I would push, I would find myself getting really anxious or depressed or my body would just simply stop working. And so if you're feeling, you know, some illness coming forward or you're feeling heaviness or despair or strange symptoms, first try just slowing down, unhooking from the busyness of life. And just see. See what your body's telling you. You know, for most of us in, the, in previous incarnations, the awakening process would happen you know, while we were at the convent or the monastery. But now that we're living in the world and we have such busy lives, you know, it's like our nervous system. It hasn't, it hasn't fully been prepared to live in such a busy way. And when we're downloaded these energies of awakening, Sometimes it creates the perfect storm and illness comes forward. But one of the great things that illness is telling us is to slow down. Slow down. So beautiful. Those are great questions. Okay. Uh, let me see this next question. Uh, Craig, in the last weeks I've been extremely reactive and sensitive to rejection and different forms of aggression from significant others like my children. Uh, it makes me feel uh, tremendously afraid of truly, you know, opening in my heart, my soul, and my humanity. You know, I've worked with victim consciousness before and tried Buddhist approaches such as uh, take the blame, you know, take the blames to ego and remain like a log, even though I feel it is absolutely unfair. Okay, yes. Uh, so if, if you're feeling like a victim, if your children are attacking you or beating you up, and I, I know this experience because, you know, very much, uh, you know, I've, I've raised children before, you know, I have a teenage daughter, and there's many times she attacks me. And so if she's attacking me, there's going to be days when I take it on and breathe it in and let it go. But there's also going to be, uh, you know, times when I admit fully, you know, what she's saying hurts. And so I have to be willing and humble enough to say no, to set clear boundaries. You know, there's too many spiritual people who are like wet noodles. And so when someone's being abusive to you, you know, we're not just going to sit back and take it. That's not true spirituality. You know, if we want to live like Christ in the world, we say yes to the truth. And we say no to that which is untrue. So it's important that you set boundaries with those around you. you know, self-esteem, having a good, healthy self-esteem is one of the most powerful steps forward we can take on the path. And so when you have true self-esteem, you don't let people abuse you. You don't let people walk all over you. And so I've worked with so many people who have this sense of victim consciousness, who are who, who in a real sense are like wet, you know, wet noodles. And so if you're a wet noodle on the path, what you'll find is you'll start to become angry. You'll start to become resentful of those who love you. And what that anger and resentment is telling you is you need to come down into your belly. Breathe deep into the heart chakra. Breathe into your solar plexus and wake up your strength. And say, no, you cannot treat me this way. This is unfair. I will not stand for it. So it's a radical act of love to say no to abuse. And as you do so, when you begin to say no to abuse and yes to your truth, yes to the fact that there's a, you know, a woman here who's struggling, when you say yes to that little girl inside, I'm going to protect you. I'm not going to let people walk all over you. It's a radical act of self-love. 
And as your love grows for yourself, what you'll find is people will begin to treat you better. But I want to be crystal clear here. Boundaries are an absolute necessity. We're not, no one's asking you to roll over and be like a log. That teaching is if you have a big, fat, entitled ego, which Lisa, you do not. You don't have a big, fat, entitled ego. If you do, you know, if for any of us listening who do, yeah, then the invitation is to relax, breathe, you know, look at the blame, breathe in and out, see if we can accept it, let it roll off our back. But when you struggle with victim consciousness, the invitation is to come deep into your belly and say no. No to the abuse and yes to that which is true, that which is good about you. And so, anyways, that's a beautiful question. Sorry it took me so long to get to you. Uh, Vishal, do you have a, a question? You know, if so, uh, if so, let me know and I'll let you, um, yeah, grab the mic. Hey, Craig. I had a, uh, a question about grace and the refusal of it. I feel like I've, I've kind of been struggling with this thing where, um, you know, after my retreat, there was this beautiful sort of, I was just graced with the kind of, uh, uh, bodily kind of spiritual opening where suddenly the the kriyas and the the the, the intense shay and the, the energy was flowing beautifully and uh, you know it's this weird pattern when 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 i am graced when i am blessed by god suddenly there's this it only lasts for so long because at some point i start thinking you know i don't deserve this i have to pay penance for this i actually have to struggle <laughs> you know to make up for it like um so yeah just this general pattern and even in the material world it's it's a similar thing i, I might find a, you know a beautiful job and it'll only last for so long and then there's struggle in the material world as well so um i was wondering if you can just kind of talk about i don't know maybe i think it's just like not feeling worthy of grit having to work hard for grace and uh i don't know just kind of making the path more difficult than it has to be thank you Yes, and so that's a, that's a beautiful question, Vishal. So, and so I invite you to look at this, you know, with an open heart. You know, to sit down right now, to close your eyes, to feel in your heart and ask, am I worthy? Am I worthy of grace? Am I worthy of God's love? Am I worthy of a good life here on planet Earth? Am I worthy? Am I here just to suffer? Am I here to let everyone go before me? Am I here just to live in hell? Vishal, there is something quite beautiful about your heart. There's such an innocence about your nature. You know, as I feel into you, there's a beauty, there's a gentleness, there's a tenderness. You are absolutely worthy, my friend, of that which is good. Absolutely worthy. You're absolutely worthy of a grace-filled life. Now, I'm not going to kid anyone and act like, you know, life here on planet Earth is going to be, you know, a walk in the park, you know, from now until, until eternity. And so, yes, there's going to be times when things are difficult. And so if it's just, you know, a random moment of difficulty, you breathe in, you breathe out, and you let it go. But if there's any feeling that you don't deserve, you know, then there's something off within your consciousness. And so it's important for you to look down, look into your heart and invoke, you know, a, you know, a childlike presence within you. And notice, why does that kid within you feel 
unworthy. Why does he feel unworthy? What's that about? Did your father treat you, you know, teach you that or your mother or some friends or family or simply did you come into the world with this feeling? You know, I came into this, uh, this lifetime with many previous incarnations as a monk. And so, you know, I was quite comfortable with letting everyone go before me. I was quite comfortable sleeping on the floor. I was quite comfortable with, you know, feeding myself scraps. But when my heart started to wake up inside, I realized there's this absolute beauty here. But there's also a little kid who's starving. A little kid who's scared to come forward. There's a little kid who's felt beat up by life. A kid within me that's felt abused by others and also abused by myself. And so I encourage you. Just to feel in your heart. And ask, why is it? Why is it that there's a part of me that feels unworthy? Why is it there's a part of me that feels like he can't receive grace? Or I can only receive it temporarily. I don't, I don't, <laughs> you know, I don't get to have it in the long term. You know, and this may sound strange, but I'm going to, I'm going to say it anyways, but Michelle, when I, when I sit here and I feel into your presence, and I can feel the great mother coming forward saying, let me in, let me love you, let me hold you, let me take good care of you. And so she's showing up here, inviting you to open your heart to her. You to open your heart to life. You to open your heart to truth. And the truth is, you are a child of God. Just like me and everyone else here on planet Earth. You know, one of the greatest sins that we can commit is divorcing ourselves from God. Putting this dividing line between us and life between that which is beautiful, that which is good. You don't have to live in that way, my friend. You don't have to live in that way. And so I invite you, open your heart to what's here. And notice that there's this love and this presence that's eternally here, just wanting to love you. You know, we forget that when we study too much non-duality, we just think of God as vast, spacious awareness. We think of, you know, for a good Buddhist, we think of, of God as emptiness. But I'll tell you, my friend, there is a personal God who loves you, who's here right now, who wants nothing more than to fill your heart, to hold you. You do not have to be alone in this world. And if we go back to some of our uh, conversations that we've had in the past about, you know, opening the lower belly chakra. We we'll begin to open the lower belly, the hara. We are saying yes to life, yes to love, yes to absolute inclusivity. We include our non-dual nature and our personal nature. We are saying, I trust. I'm open, I'm willing to trust. I'm open, I'm willing to receive. And as soon as you begin to open, you realize, you know that old saying as it goes, if you take one step towards God, she takes 10 to, toward you. Sometimes 100 to you. <laughs> you take one step to God, she takes 100 to you. And so can you open your heart and see? Now, many people make this mistake of they look for God in their mind, and you will not find God there. You find God 
in your belly, in your body. And so this invitation is, can you fully open? Can you fully receive the truth of your being, the hugeness of your nature? Can you say yes to life, yes to love? And let this unworthiness fall away. Let it wash away as you open your heart to that which is good, that which is true, that which is holy. And so, yes, my friend, this is a beautiful, a beautiful question that you brought forward. And most of us struggle with this in one form or another. We feel alone. We feel isolated. We feel like we're a victim of this world, like we're a victim of life. And so the grand invitation here is, can you open up and see that you are being held? See. You know, the most practical way, can you open your eyes and see the beauty all around you? Can you see that you have food in your belly? Can you see that you have beautiful friends and family? Can you see the big blue sky that's holding us all? Can you open to that? You know, you live in Los Angeles, so can you open and see that that vast Pacific Ocean is holding you, is nurturing you? And so that's the earthly experience of the divine. And then I encourage you to, to invoke this heavenly experience of the divine where you call upon her. You say, yes, I'm willing to open my heart and trust despite the fact that I don't feel good, despite the fact that I feel a little depressed or a little bit off or a little bit whatever it is, can you open your heart fully and receive that which is good, that which is true, that which is beautiful about God, life, the universe, whatever you want to call it. And receive, by all means, it's free. You know, I always laugh, I tell people, Having a relationship with God, with life, the universe is free. It doesn't cost anything. And all, you know, this, this great force, you know, in Buddhism we call it Pragna Paramita, the great mother, wants nothing more than to love. And so this creation, you know, the reason we are created was to experience the fullness of life. We weren't created just to come here to suffer. And so, yes, my friend, beautiful, uh, beautiful question. Okay, so let me see here. So uh, I got a, still a bunch of questions. So let me see what's here. Uh, this one's from uh, Thane. Uh, and yes, Vishal, if, if I didn't answer it clearly, you can, uh, you can let me know too. Uh, anyways, uh, here's, a, here's a question from Thane. He said, a couple weeks ago, I asked you a question about how non-dual teachings can be at odds with those who have suffered uh, trauma and haven't uh, completed healthy egoic development. You mentioned that the remedy is uh, to learn to mother oneself and love oneself. Yes, I find that when practicing loving myself, I'm trading less charitable views of myself for more charitable ones. Is the adopting of a better self story, uh, granting I find it believable, okay in the near term? Yeah, I mean the the big the big thing thing is that that you know we're talking about love here on the path, and so any mother and any father when they look at their child, they can't help but love that kid, and so I want you to look at yourself the same way. So I don't want this to be a difficult thing. I want it to be an easy thing. So can you open your heart? Get in touch with that which is good. That which is true and innocent about your nature. And love the parts of you that have been rejected by life. And so when we have attachment trauma, that means our parents weren't fully there. When we have developmental trauma, which, you know, most of us have, you know, some of that, you know, because most of us, we didn't have perfect parents. But the invitation is for you to consistently love yourself. Not in a psychological way. I mean, that's okay. You know, you can think positive thoughts and this kind of thing. But I'm asking you to wake up, thing, to the goodness of your heart. 
the goodness of your heart. And then look yourself in the mirror and say, yes, I'm going to love that guy. And then Vishal, this, this goes the same with you, the same with all of us. There's unworthiness in us, which is almost always because, you know, we either <laughs> came in, you know, to this lifetime with it, or our parents let us down, you know, which is an easy thing. <laughs> because as parents, you cannot be perfect. And so the idea is, you look yourself in the eyes. And you say, I'm going to love that guy. I'm going to love that girl. I'm going to love me. And the way I'm speaking about doing it, it should bring tears to your eyes. Where you see your beauty, you see your goodness, you see your innocence. And you say, yes. I see there's something good in there. And so I'm choosing, choosing to love that which is good. Choosing to love that which is good. So yes, my friend. And so if you need to make baby steps, you know, to get there, yes, that's absolutely fine. But the invitation here is to love yourself fully and open-heartedly. So you're becoming quiet, coming into the heart, taking deep breaths. And whatever you see in there, whether it's anger, sadness, depression, heartache, you're choosing to say, yes, I'm willing to acknowledge this pain. I'm willing to feel it fully. I'm willing to breathe through it. I'm willing to self-soothe. All of this, my friend, helps the ego to heal to relax, to get out of the fight or flight response. It helps it to develop in a healthy manner. And when the ego is developed in a healthy manner, it's easy to let go. But it's very difficult to let go when we have trauma. You know, when we live uh, with, with a consciousness, a humanity that's traumatized, it's very hard to surrender. very hard to surrender and so you're feeling inside you're connecting with that which is good that which is true that which is innocent about your nature and you're saying yes this is me this divinity is me and oh <laughs> there's a humanity here that's struggling i was beat up as a child and so we're choosing to love that aspect of ourselves. and so yes a beautiful uh Beautiful question, my friend. Okay, so let me see, uh, you know, what else I have here. Uh, Craig, I'm wondering if I should uh, continue hugging people. Uh, some, uh, a healer once told me that when I hug Others, I'll take on their energy, and I want to take on their karma. Uh, it'll it'll make me uh, take on their karma. Excuse me. Uh, what should I do? Well, this is a uh, you know this is a funny question. I've seen this a lot in you know different spiritual circles. There'll be, you know, most people are huggers. You know, and they just want to hug and hug and hug, and then occasionally there's an individual who's you know has this fear of God that if they touch someone else they'll be completely defiled by the other person's presence and so you know of course we want to be connected with our backbone and we want to live with an open heart and so when we're connected with our backbone and we live with an open heart you listen to your heart if your heart says hug you hug you know if you feel like it's a crazy toxic person then you might excuse yourself or leave the room you know but this idea of taking on energy it's like we can't be a wet noodle here on the spiritual path. We have to be strong enough to feel. But you don't have to take on everyone's karma. You don't. You don't. And so if you feel like you have taken on someone's karma, like if you hang out with someone and you, they're angry and all of a sudden you notice yourself angry, that's a moment for you to reconnect with your truth. That's a moment for you to come back to your heart. Come back to the spaciousness of your mind and see this thing within you is not yours. And so you let it go. 
you recenter yourself. You say no. No to that which is not you and yes to that which is you. And so, yeah, I get that uh, question a lot from a lot of uh, a lot of healers. You know, and you'll notice this. Massage therapists do this. You know, if they give a massage, you know, they really wash their hands, wash their face. If you're, you know, doing healing work, it's good. Just kind of cleanse yourself energetically. You know, if you work as a nurse or a doctor at a hospital, the first thing you want to do when you come home is take a big shower and just let go of the day. You know, but we need people who are strong here on planet Earth, not people who are scared of energy. We need people who are strong, who are awake, who are embodied. And the more awake and embodied you are, the greater sense of self-esteem that you are, the more you're able to wake up and hold the awakened vision. You know, the individuals who wake up and stay awake tend to be individuals who have strong self-esteem. Now, there's this, all, this, all these teachings on the path about humility, and so we want to have tremendous humility simultaneously with tremendous self-esteem, but self-esteem rooted in the depth of our heart, not in our <laughs> ego, but in the depth of our heart. And so anyways, I want to thank everyone for showing up. Uh, I thank everyone for, for coming again. Uh, you know, I appreciate everyone who's offered donations. Lynn, I want to thank you for your generous donation. I uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you all for sharing your, your hearts with me and your willingness to be hum humble and open and vulnerable. I feel so blessed, you know, feel so blessed to be connected with you all in this way. If any of you feel moved uh, to offer a donation, there's uh, details on my website about that. It's just a uh, PayPal link you can click on. And, uh, it's important that we support these teachings to help them to spread. And so whether you support it financially or you share these teachings with friends or family, you know, that's how the Dharma spreads. That's how this love spreads. But most of all, it spreads through you opening your heart, you sharing your truth and your innocence and your beauty with the world. So thank you all so much. And um, thank you again, Suzanne, for all your help with technology and everything that you do to support these teachings. May our whole world be blessed with light, with love, with happiness and joy. May peace be with you all. May, may you all have a wonderful night or morning or whatever time of day it is where you are. God bless.